Hello to all of you. We're getting ready to get started. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Make It Last, Choosing Colors, Fabrics, and Finishes. I'm Janet Nelson, the Director of Library Markets for DEMCO, and I will be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I just wanted to go through some housekeeping details, and then I'll introduce our speaker, and she can start today's presentation. On your screens, you should see a chat box on the right-hand side. If you have a question or are just having any type of technical issue, please feel free to type something there, and we'll do our best to get back to you as quickly as we can. We'll be pausing in the middle of the presentation for questions and at the end of the session if there's time. If something comes up during the session you would like clarification on or want to respond to, you can type it in and we'll be compiling your thoughts and questions and we'll address them during the breaks. We already have one great question that's come in our way. If we don't get your questions during the session, we will be sure to get answers and post them with the recorded webcast after the event. There's also specific contact information available for Jessica or myself that you should be able to see on your screen right now. After the session, you can feel free to email us directly if you have a specific question that we may be able to help with. We're also using Twitter today, and the hashtag is hashtag Demco Ideas. You should be able to see that hashtag on the side of your screen in the chat box. We are monitoring that feed as well for questions and comments. Just for fun, while I'm doing introductions, we're going to pop up a poll question on your screen. And our question is, how comfortable are you in choosing colors and fabrics for your library? You can take a minute to answer that, and we'll come back and share the results um, as soon as those are available. Now on to introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Janet Nelson, the Director of Library Markets for DEMCO, and I'm moderating this session. At DEMCO, we're always interested in, in how to better serve the needs of our customers, and these webinars have really been a great way for us to connect and provide additional information around important to topics for evolving libraries. Today's presentation is going to walk you through some basic principles that you can use to choose attractive and appropriate color schemes and durable finishes for heavily used spaces. I'm pleased to introduce you to Jessica Main, who will be our speaker. And Jessica is an instructor and in Program Director for the Interior Design Program at Madison Area Technical College here in Madison, Wisconsin. Jessica's background is in commercial design, and she was also um, a corporate interior designer and construction project manager with American Family Insurance in Madison. Her teaching experience and emphasis is in commercial design, lighting, computer-aided drawing and presentation techniques. Jessica is a professional member of the American Society of Interior Designers and the Interior Design Educators Council. She has served in several board positions for the Wisconsin chapter of ASID and has also served a term on the ASID National Board of Directors. Now before I turn it over to Jessica, I quick want to show our poll results. So it looks like most of you are somewhere in the middle um, as far as how you're, how you're feeling about color. So, so that's a good starting point. Our hope is that by the end of this session, you'll have some practical tips that allow you to be more confident in making your library look great. Jessica, we're going to put the controls in your capable hands, and you can get started when you're ready. Great. Thank you so much, Janet, for that wonderful introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me all right. I'm actually um, getting over a bit of a cold, and so um, please excuse my little bit of a raspy voice or if I clear my throat once in a while. But uh, I'm feeling much better today than I have been, and I think I'm um, ready to go, and I'm definitely very excited to be able to present this information to you today. So to give you a little bit of an overview of um, some of the information that we're going to talk about today, let's see, I'm trying to get to the... Um, I, I want to be able to um, give you a, I'm sorry, Janet, but my, my advancing of the slide is not showing up there. There we go. There. Sorry about that, folks. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about so that you um, have an idea of what to expect, and hopefully um, I will um, meet your expectations on what you were expecting to learned today and as Janet said certainly ask questions so that we can have this be a more interactive experience and more fulfilling experience for you. So I'm going to go through to start with some color theory and some talking about basic color schemes and some tips for selecting colors. I know color is, is one of the most 
Um, tricky things for a lot of people. They, they, as the majority, it looked like you said yes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with selecting colors. However, you know, would like some tips, and um, I'm going to try to take the mystery out of color selection today and give you some guidelines that will produce um, pleasant spaces no matter um, what your ability level is with color or your experience level is. Then we're going to move into talking about upholsteries and fabrics, um, some tips for choosing colors and patterns there. So the color information will um, blend over to the upholstery information, but also again when we start selecting furniture for spaces, many times it gets overwhelming because there's so many fabrics to choose from. And so how do we choose that? We're going to look at patterns and how to mix patterns together, some tips for that. And then also, of course, maintenance and durability factors that you want to consider when you're selecting upholstery. Then we're going to look at how to get most out of your, the most out of your investment. Um, we know budgets are very tight these days. And whether you're uh, building a new space or remodeling, you want to make sure that what you purchase is going to last a long time. And quality commercial pro products do last a long time, but of course you want to make sure that um, they're designed in such a way that they're appropriate for the spaces that they're in so that they last in those spaces. For example, spaces that have food or drink. So we're going to talk about that. Also, we know technology is something that is at the forefront, so we'll touch on a couple tips for technology integration and some other product features that you want to consider with furniture. And then wrap up by looking at some finishing touches. We can have great color schemes, great um, fabrics selected with the correct durability and maintenance in mind, but then if we have no accessories, artwork, lighting, the space hasn't really come to life. So we want to make sure we pull it all together at the end. So first, let's take a look at some basic color theory here. So um, what you're looking at on the screen is the color wheel, one of uh, a color wheel, many color wheel systems. And this is a pretty basic one. It has um, three divisions, kind of a three-part division to these colors. And most of us know, whether it was from grade school, um, art class, or you know, whether you're an experienced designer, you know that primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. And that's pretty basic. But then when we get to more complex colors, we see that if we mix our red and um, yellow and blue together in pairs, we get our secondary colors. So for example, we have the green, the orange, and the purple or violet color. Now our more um, complex colors, the very complex colors come in in our tertiary colors. These are the yellow orange, red orange, red violet, blue violet, blue green and yellow green and those colors are formed by mixing a primary and a secondary color and so that's why that hue is actually a two-word name such as blue green for example so we can all see this sort of rainbow array of colors on the screen but it, it doesn't still help us figure out how to how to use colors and of course it doesn't represent all the variations of colors that are out there so we're going to get into that so of course, in life, whether it's in your house, your library, um, you've looked at paint colors, I'm sure, at some point. And you walk up to the um, rack of paint colors at your local um, home construction store, and there's thousands and thousands to choose from. And they are all based upon this color wheel, but you should just note that the colors I just mentioned were the hue name, the pure color name. If you look at um, a lighter version, so you like you have red, say a lighter version of that is pink. That's just the hue plus white. Then you might have a mauve, for example, and that's that hue of red plus gray. Then you might have a shade like maroon, where it's the hue of red plus black. So that's where we get our millions of variations of color here. Now what I haven't mentioned on this is um, is black or brown, and especially brown is not on the color wheel. Black is created by by mixing all the primaries together. Um, but brown itself is, is a little bit of a tricky one because browns and tans and beiges, they can actually be in a neutral um, color scheme. So we know if you think of like a wood tone, for example, um, some wood tones are, are in the brown range and they don't really lend themselves to 
um, being a red brown, like maybe a cherry wood. And those can be used more liberally in a space along with some of the color schemes that I'm going to mention. Whereas um, another neutral is gray, very commonly used in a lot of public spaces. And then we mix those neutrals with a color. So I think when you see some of the examples I have coming up, this will all make a lot more sense. So what my first tip for you today is to use a color harmony in your space. Um, color harmonies are set arrangements of colors, um, whether it be a pair or three colors or multiple colors, that you can look at and find on a color wheel and actually know that those colors go together because that's where we start um, getting nervous a lot of times um, where we, we look at colors, we get overwhelmed, and we're not sure what goes with what. Well, I'm here to tell you today what some um, co planned color schemes, color harmonies can help you um, in your space. So there's four of them that we're just going to focus on. They're called analogous, complementary, split complementary, and triad. And you can see some of those um, schemes pulled out on the color wheel on the slide there, but I'm going to go into each one individually. Using these schemes is really a great way to create um, a pleasant space that will be appropriate for multi-ages, multi-cultures, um, etc. because it's just a pleasant combination. Many of them come from nature. So analogous colors. Analogous colors are um, a great way to get started. Um, analogous color schemes are when you choose colors that sit directly next to each other on the color wheel. So if you look at the color wheel graphic at the top of the slide here, we've got the entire color wheel, but then we start at the red and we move through yellow using the orange and the yellow orange. And by using all of those colors together, we create, in that case, a warm color scheme, a pleasant color scheme. However, it doesn't need to be the red to the yellow. It can be any colors that touch each other on the color wheel. So you can see the photo example below. We actually have a blue, a blue-green, a green and a little bit of yellow green in that wall area there and that is an analogous color scheme. Now that analogous color scheme is also offset with a lot of neutrals in the space. So if you look at the carpet in the space it looks very gray and then the maple is kind of a neutral tan as well. So that's how you can work with colors and not get them to be too overwhelming in a space. Keep um, the flooring perhaps more neutral some of the bookcases and display cases more neutral and put the colors on the wall. That can be an idea. Also another thing I wanted to note about analogous color schemes, particularly the one that I show here with the blue through yellow green, it might remind you actually of nature. And color schemes that mimic nature with blues, greens, perhaps browns integrated, um, and maybe just small pops of other colors, they're generally found to be pleasant across many age groups and research has found that they can enhance learning. So any kind of mimic, mimicking of nature, bringing the outside in, can be um, an enhancement to the learning process. If we look at complementary colors, these are colors that sit um, directly opposite each other on the color wheel. So if you see the color wheel again, graphic at the top of the screen, you see the yellow and the violet directly across from each other on that, on that color wheel. Now, pictured here, though, is actually um, a tip I have for you, which is when you actually create a complementary, complementary color scheme and you choose that as your basis for your colors, I would encourage you to look beyond those primary colors. I would look at something like this, where you have the red-orange and the blue-green. Those still are sitting across from each other, like, across each other on the color wheel. If you see, here's the red-orange and the blue-green. And you can see it has a more sophisticated look. So I know sometimes we try to figure out how to um, appeal to adults versus um, children in a space. Using a more sophisticated color palette, like using those tertiary colors in a complementary scheme, can be a way to integrate that. This picture shows, again, the red-orange and blue-green and you can see it doesn't have to be only those colors, though. There's a little bit of yellow in some of the fabric, and that's OK. Um, there's also multiple variations in those two colors, and that creates interest as well. If you have trouble remembering what a complementary color palette is, 
just think of a very popular complementary color palette that comes around in December for all of us um, is a Christmas theme, uh, holiday colors, red and green. That's a very popular contrast um, in the complementary colors. And it's a good way to remember just that the complementary colors are two and they're directly across from each other on the color wheel, the red and green. We look at split complementary. Now we are getting a little bit more complex because now we're using um, for sure three colors on the color wheel and they're no longer sitting next to each other. We're using the idea of the complement, so a color, and then looking across from it on the color wheel. However, not using that color, we're using the two neighbors of that color. So, for example, in this we have the um, the orange color, and then we have the the um, excuse me, the yellow orange color, and then the blue and the violet um, across from it. And in the illustration and the picture, you can see that mural wall that's there has um, a yellow, orange, um, a blue, and a violet in it. And this happens to be um, in a high school library. And I have read studies that the the blues and purples, or blues and violet um, tones, can be more um, appealing to adolescents and teenagers than, say, grade school age. So it's a very appropriate mural in this space. Um, it can be a more difficult uh, harmony to balance than others, um, but it really does offer a lot of contrast without too much intensity. And it, it's can be one that you might want to consult with a design professional on to make sure you're implementing correctly, but it really creates an interesting look and not something always expected, but it's very pleasant. I also want to point out that neutrals can lend themselves into a direction of a color. So um, depending upon how your, this is appearing on your screen, you might be able to discern that the carpet that is there is gray. However, it also has a bit of a violet shade undertone to it. So you have the violet um, gray in the carpet, then you have the blue chairs, the, um, and then the yellow orange on the, on the mural, and it's all working together to create that split complementary. There is some green in there, and once you know rules, you can break them. <laughs> um, and it just goes to show that um, it doesn't necessarily have to be pure those colors, those three colors, but keeping those the dominant colors does help direct your scheme, which is, which is what we're all looking for, is a direction to go in rather than just feeling like you're out there with all of those millions of colors with no direction. The last uh, scheme that I wanted to talk about is the triad scheme. And the triad scheme is one that we actually probably are more familiar with. And that's using three colors that are equally spaced around the color wheel. And a very common one that we see with this is using the primary colors of red, yellow, and blue in a space. Now, when you use red, yellow, and blue in a space, um, depending upon what variation of that hue you're using, you can really tailor it to the audience that you're in. So for example here, on the right side, we actually have a young children's space. Um, and we see more of a pure hue of the red, yellow, and blue being used in that space. Whereas uh, the upper left corner, we actually are starting to see more of a maroon and a navy being used. And those are creating a more muted triad scheme, but still actually using the red, yellow, and blue. So thinking about how you could use a scheme in different areas of your space, perhaps you have a teen area, a children's area, an adult area, you could actually still um, create your scheme based upon a triad layout, but change the hue so that it's more appealing to that group so that you have one unifying theme throughout the whole space. Um, I know sometimes people feel like spaces that have multiple color schemes for those different areas I mentioned can seem a little bit disjointed. So this is one way to kind of keep it all together. Um, and then if one chair moves from one space to another, it's no big deal because it's still a triad scheme. Um, and I do have another tip for you as well with a triad scheme. And that's to think about how you actually 
use the color, what proportions of the color you use. So as I have on the slide, the best way to balance those colors is select one dominant hue and use the other two remaining for an accent. So if you'd like more guideline on that, one thought is to use the 60-30-10 rule. Now this tip applies to commercial spaces and it can apply to your home. So if you um, are working on a home renovation project, it can work the same way. So after you choose three shades of uh, color scheme that you're going to use, um, one way to make sure that, that colors don't get lost and the emphasis is placed where you want it is to break them down into 60% one dominant color, 30% a secondary color, and 10% an accent color. And so you can see here um, we actually have a gray circle as a 60% color. So if you were going to use, a, for example, a complementary color scheme, uh, perhaps using a gray or a beige for most of the areas, 60%, would be a way to keep the space looking a little bit more timeless. Neutrals tend to be more timeless. Where then you could add in, perhaps if you were doing um, the blue-green, red-orange color scheme, you could have the blue-green be the 30% color, and then the red-orange, um, which is a really vibrant and active color, be the 10%. So you don't have to feel like you have to use them equally. It really does help if you vary the proportion of them. Perhaps the 60% are painting your walls and your floors those colors. Maybe your secondary color, the 30%, could represent the colors that end up on lounge seating, for example. And then your accent color could be perhaps um, some small side chair seating or just maybe a mural wall or an accent wall so that it's not too overpowering. But mixing those three is a really good way to um, at those proportions, it's a really good way to make sure that scheme is um, appropriate for the space and not too overwhelming. We've all probably been in spaces where um, one of the bright colors is just used too much and actually gets distracting, so we don't want that. So now I'll turn it over to Janet and see, before I move on to fabric, see if there's any questions about color theory. Thank you, Jessica. That was really a great overview of, of color that we can all put into use. So one thing that we wanted to find out, we all know that practice makes perfect and using what we learn is, is a good way to um, put it into practice. So we have a quick question for you. Um, how soon do you expect to put this color information to use? So you can take a second to answer that. And we do have um, a couple questions in here. Um, the first question is, what colors can brighten and refresh a library with poor lighting. Um, this particular person is looking for something that's modern and appealing, but not too childish. Um, so I don't know if you have any hints on things to do when the, you have poor lighting. Sure, that's a great question. Um, lighting is definitely, could, could be a, com, a whole entire another webinar because it can be so complex and it gets very technical. Um, one thing that I would look for is to figure out if you can if your lighting is um, very cool color lighting appearance or warm color. Many times in, in commercial spaces we have a cool color lighting. Fluorescent lights generally are more cool colors. So what can, um, in those cool colored lighting schemes, we have a lot of blue actually in the light. So um, if you have spaces that actually are warm, like red and orange, in that space it'll look washed out because there's no red and orange in the light being reflected out in the color. So I would recommend to think about that. Again, I'm probably making the assumption of maybe a whiter or a bluer light, but lighter color tones definitely, which is probably obvious. Um, uh, you're not, not taking a navy color scheme, but a light blue would work better. But also thinking about um, probably something that would reflect that bluish hue um, would work a little bit better than trying to compete with it and having browns or reds or oranges actually, which seems maybe counterproductive, but um, working with a design professional and trying to figure out what your lighting actually is and what colors will be enhanced under that light can really be important. Lighting and color work together so um, so much and, and it's really important to, to have that interaction between it. Great advice, Jessica. 
Um, could you, we have another question here. Um, could you let us know um, what do you do when you have color that's part of your architecture and you're stuck with that, but you want to do some updating? Sure. Well, color that we have in architecture, I've dealt with many, many times. Um, I would say, of course, it's best, and I'll be getting to this later in the webinar, if, if the color could be neutral, if you have the choice moving forward to pick colors that are attached to the architecture to make those neutral. However, I would just really encourage you not to fight it, so to speak. Um, I know I've worked on a project where we have um, laminate cabinets that are dark maroon, and we feel like, oh the gosh, they were from the 80s in that maroon color tone. But surprisingly enough, when we used the color harmony and looked at that burgundy um, or maroon color and tried to find a scheme that pulled out either um, you know, a complementary color or a split complementary to that, and made those new colors the dominant colors and tried to downplay that color that we didn't like, um, we were still able to integrate it in a way that um, is pleasant, but we didn't fight it anymore. I see way too many people trying to ignore that color that they feel is dated or um, is not pleasant. And you'll do a lot better many times if you actually try to integrate it using one of those color harmonies that I mentioned. Great, Jessica. We, um, we have some more questions coming in, but I also would like to make sure that we get through everything here. So um, we're going to hold those questions until the end, and we're going to have you go ahead and continue with the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Sounds good. So as Janet mentioned, I did give just a very basic overview of color theory, some ideas of how to where to start basically with your schemes and I should mention also that that color wheel that I showed you can go to um, your local hobby or art store and pick up a color wheel for just a few dollars and they will have the ability the, the color wheel will have the ability for you to turn it and it will show you exactly those color harmonies that I showed you the complementary spin it around look at a split complementary, spin it around, look at a triad. And so you don't have to have those memorized, and they can be right in front of you when you're selecting um, paint colors or fabrics and finishes. So that might be something to just get and throw in your desk drawer if you know you have a project coming up, which it looks like several of you do. Um, and it, it's just a nice way to reinforce that information and, and give you a direction. So. When we think of colors, many times we're thinking of paint colors, but we're also th sometimes thinking of fabric colors. But when we have color, we also many times have hand-in-hand -hand pattern um, that goes with it. And pattern many times comes in with our furniture fabrics or our architectural finishes, so like flooring perhaps, um, carpet patterns or wallpaper patterns and things like that. So I'm going to start with some tips that really work well if your floor color is a solid color or a very small scale pattern. Uh, many commercial carpets have uh, lots of colors within them, but if you stand back, it gives you one dominant color. Maybe it looks a little bit like it's blue with lots of little other speckles in it, or brown with lots of other little speckles in it. Um, that's what I'm talking about, uh, some sort of solid mostly majority solid color floor. This, these techniques I'm going to go through work really well. So if you're going to select then fabrics or upholsteries for furniture that's going to sit on that floor, that solid floor, what you want to first do is choose one dominant or common color for all those pattern fabrics. This will really create um, kind of a uh, can't go wrong kind of scheme if you, if you do this. And if you look on the screen here, I have an example where all of the the base colors of these three fabrics is blue. If you just glance at the screen, I think you get that impression. We have blue, blue, blue on each of those little sofas. Um, however, you can see that they're not all the same pattern. Um, but by keeping them all in that blue range, we already create um, unity by that repetition of color. And that's one of the design elements that um, will help your space look um, put together. What we also sometimes run into is uh, pattern and how do we pick out patterns that look good together. Well, when 
you're trying to put patterns together that look good together, uh, one rule to think of is the large, medium, small rule. So you want to look at the scale of the pattern itself. And at most, in one area, you typically want to have one large, one medium, and one small scale pattern. And I point out that it's in, within an area that this occurs. So if you have a very large space, for example, a large library space, you may have a teen area, you may have a separate children's area, you may have a separate adult fiction area, something like that. This scheme of large, medium, and small can be integrated in each of those areas, not across the whole library. So, um, and that creates interest within those areas, so just to keep that in mind. Um, so if you look at the slide here, you can see this overall blue scheme of this top uh, fabric here. I just have it in detail on the right. Um, it has actually a medium scale to its to the to the pattern of the fabric. And when you look at it in detail, it does have more than just blue in it. It has some um, yellow orange, some blue green, and that will add um, some interest as well. So it's not completely kind of a monotonous blue color. Um, and then you can see those colors that yellow, uh, yellow orange, blue green are actually repeated in the other fabrics as well. And those fabrics are at a small, the middle one is a small scale fabric um, pattern. And then of course the bottom one is a very large scale fabric pattern. Um, a lot of times people get nervous over using a large scale fabric pattern. Um, but if you balance it out with the other two scales, it won't be overwhelming and it'll just add some fun to your space. Um, the patterns themselves also can vary whether they're um, more organic or curvilinear, shaped like nature, leaves and flowers, or geometric like the top one where it's um, more um, almost like typewriter um, objects that would come out of your, your word processing machine. You have the asterisks and the circles and things like that. And actually these fabrics all can look good together if they have the unifying element of the color and um, variation of the scale. So you don't have to worry about mixing um, the organic or the flowers with the geometric shapes. It, it will work together because the other elements are making it work. Um, I would caution you against just selecting one scale of fabric. One scale of fabric in a space um, will, will really kind of create more of a um, kind of a, a boring and monotonous scheme. Um, so making that variation is where you get the liveliness in the space. Um, however, the opposite can be true as well, that you know, you've probably been in spaces where the space kind of looks cluttered. And the problem there is typically that um, you get a cluttered look when every pattern is the same scale. So this definite uh, variation in small, medium to large is what you want to look for um, in those patterns. And I happen to use this example here of fabrics that are all from one manufacturer. And that's a really good way to select fabrics that have a continuous color theme within them because the designers that put together those fabrics within that um, manufacturer know that people want to mix and match. So that's why these colors go together really well. They were, they were put together to be a scheme that can work together. Um, you know, if you're working with a design professional, definitely tap into them to make sure that their, um, their expertise is putting these color schemes together. And I think you can, you can definitely bounce some ideas off of them. But um, now you'll have a little bit of a background that you can come to the table with some ideas of your own. I mentioned on the previous slide that was really good tips for if your flooring is more solid um, in, in nature, more monochromatic. Now, many times spaces have carpets or flooring patterns that have a lot of bold patterns to them. And that's what we have in these three photo examples. And you can see here that that is actually taking the place of the large scale fabric pattern. So if you have a very large scale carpet pattern, like these three examples do, what I would recommend is go to a smaller scale fabric pattern. So if you see this example in the middle right here, this um, chair that's in the front has a medium size scale pattern to it. It actually also has a solid seat, which might be a vinyl seat, which is another tip I have for you in a few minutes. 
Um, and then you can see the top and the bottom, we have more of a solid or very, very small scale pattern um, up against the contrast of a large scale pattern. Um, it's very important to keep that in mind because, again, if you have a really large scale fabric pattern against a large scale carpet pattern, it will feel cluttered and it just won't be very pleasant to the eye. So those are some tips for selecting color, pattern, size, and scale. But we know that none of that really matters if the um, fabrics wear out before we are ready to change them out. And we need fabrics and furniture that are going to last a very long time because budgets are tight. So I have a few tips for you on um, terminology to look for when you are shopping for furniture, whether it's um, yourself looking um, to purchase or working with a design professional, know that these finishes are out there so that um, you can get the best performance out of your fabrics that you possibly can. So the first one I'm going to mention is one called a Krypton fabric. And Krypton fabric is provides excellent stain resistance and excellent wear. You should note that it might be it will be more expensive than something that is a typical commercial fabric that's not a Krypton. However, the price, um, in this case, you get what you pay for. You are going to get a product that will wear um, very, very well and will be extremely stain resistant. In this case, what's interesting about Krypton fabrics is that the fibers in the fabric are permanently transformed with the stain and microbial protection before they get a uh, integrated moisture barrier. So you can see the picture of the glass with the liquid spilled on it and how that, fat, that uh, liquid is beaded up on the fabric. That's what will happen on a Krypton fabric um, if uh, something is spilled on it. The, the moisture does not go through the fabric. It beads up. Um, if it happens to finally dry on the fabric because no one ever wiped it up, um, it's extremely cleanable. In fact, um, some Kryptons, you need to check with each manufacturer, but some Kryptons can be washed with bleach and it will not damage the color of the fabric or the um, durability of the fabric. Um, and the nice thing with Kryptons is that they're actually available from many different manufacturers. So this one example that I'm showing you on the screen is from a manufacturer called Maharam. However, um, furniture companies utilize multiple different fabric companies for their furniture, and those multiple different fabric companies, almost all of them from commercial, the commercial side of things, have Krypton fabrics available within them. So it's not a specific fabric line that you're looking for, it's within that fabric, a type of, within that upholstery manufacturer, a type of fabric. Um, so it's, it's a really great thing to look for. Um, Krypton, that's the word to remember. And when you're working with a design professional, just make sure to identify those areas where food will be used, um, where spills might occur, um, where you might have the public coming in and um, spending a lot of time, perhaps if you're in a metropolitan area. I know some libraries, um, the areas become uh, warming shelters for the homeless. So these kinds of things you need to keep into consideration, but make sure you're communicating with your design professional so that they know what your needs are and you can balance that and provide perhaps a Krypton fabric for that. I, I can't recommend Kryptons enough. They're, they're a great product. Um, they also provide excellent durability so the fabric will not wear out. Um, some additional items to think about when choosing fabrics are some finishes that can be added on top of the fabrics. Now, again, these are not things that you need to memorize, um, but just know that they exist so that um, when you're looking at fabrics, um, know that you don't have to stop at the fabric selection. Ask the question, are there finishes that can be added to enhance performance? I heard about this. So here's some of the things to, to ask about. One is a Teflon finish. Teflon finish is one that um, is stain and soil re repellent, um, and it's applied to the fabric. Um, to, re to repel those stains. It's a great one. It's a, a lower cost solution. Um, and I should mention also that each of these different finishes are available 
available because different types of fabrics can only accept different types of finishes. So that's why there's a variety of them. So it's not necessarily that one is better than another, but certain um, fabric contents can only accept certain finishes. So that's something that um, you would want to definitely check with a design professional on. Uh, I'll move on to nanotex. You can see the um, illustration there of nanotex. Um, with nanotex, um, it's a nanotechnology that provides a permanent molecular bond uh, with the fabric that results in a protective finish that provides an extremely high level of soil, soil and stain resistance and provides easy maintenance and great cleaning um, properties for upholstery and also um, vertical panel fabrics can be treated with nanotex. So not only does it resist the spill, the spills roll off, but the stains wash out if something does, again, happen to sit there long enough um, and dry on top, basically, of the fabric, it can be wiped away. So nanotex is um, a great technology that's available with that perma permanent molecular bond, excuse me. <clears throat> Um, antimicrobial finishes, we don't want to forget about those because you may have areas where um, you want to inhibit the growth of bacteria, mildew, fungi, um, inhibit odors, and these will be finishes that um, can be added to the fabric to do that. Um, so, you know, talking about that and thinking that through, identifying those areas where that might be an issue is really, really important. A couple other ones to think about are um, a C1 and C1.5 protective coating. Again, it's just another coating that's out there that enhances the stain resistance and cleaning and can only be used on certain types of uh, fabrics. And then one that's not a finish that goes on top, but one that is a barrier that goes underneath the fabric, you can ask for a laminated fluid barrier to be applied to the back of the fabric so that it resists penetration of fluids actually into the furniture, um, into the cushion, and into the frame. Um, so if there's been some areas in your spaces that have really um, been treated poorly by uh, spills and stains, thinking about a laminated fluid, fluid barrier is something um, that you can, can do. So these are all things just to be aware of. Um, again, working with a design professional when it gets to maintenance and wear to make sure that the right finish is on the right fabric is so important. So we talked a little bit about an overview of durability, or excuse me, um, cleanability in that sense for durability, but now we want to talk about resistance to abrasion a factor for durability. Um, if you've ever worked with a, a design professional, they may have thrown around this term double rubs, and it's a very odd term when you're not familiar with it. Um, what double rubs are referring to is if you select a fabric, um, every commercial fabric will have been rated um, by the Association for Contract Textiles um, to a test in which they take the fabric and they rub another fabric against it back and forth, hence the double rub, and they test how long and how many rubs it takes before you actually see wear on the fabric. So that's the surface wear. I'm sure we've all seen some fabrics where you can actually start to see the surface wear down. Well, 15,000 double rubs is the absolute minimum for contract upholstery, commercial upholstery, to be um, rated at. However, it's really honestly not recommended for any kind of public space. Um, that would be maybe a side chair in a private office for a 15,000 double rub. Even that, um, I, I wouldn't go in that range. Better off, in my opinion, to go into the 30,000 30, range for double rubs in, in that case. But public spaces, we want to be looking at 100,000 double rubs, which might sound like a lot, but when you want that fabric to perform and look good 10 years from now, because you know 10, 15 years down the line may, may be the next time that you get money to replace those things, we want these fabrics to last a long time. So looking at fabrics that not only have the clean ability that you want, but the double rubs in about 100,000, um, 100,000 range for public spaces, um, that's what you want to be looking for. Now I do have a note here that double rubs exceeding 100,000 may not be meaningful and provide additional value. I just put that in there because there are some manufacturers that will really push the fact that their fabric is say 200,000 double rubs versus 100,000. Between 100,000 and 200,000 is actually a very um, 
small difference in practice when that fabric's in the space um, because of how much wear it typically gets, unless you're talking about an airport 24-7 um, space. So most commercial spaces that are open, say 12 hours a day, $100,000 rubs is great. And again, it might be more expensive, but in this case, you really are getting what you pay for out of it. So when you look at double rubs and you look at pattern and you look at um, a maintenance factors, we want to think about you know how can we start putting these things together. And just one other tip I have for you is to think about mixing fabrics together and choosing a fabric um, for a back of a chair versus um, the seat of the chair, which could be vinyl, where vinyl has a great antimicrobial and stain resistant property property to it just inherently can be a great way to balance that. Still get some pattern in um, in the seat back and some texture and then have that cleanability in the seat and it's usually a, a value um, added component that you can put in there and the cost is not cost prohibitive when you choose a vinyl seat. So <clears throat> bringing this even further together, I, I do have a few um, tips that I think hopefully will help you and answer some of the questions that you might have on other considerations to, um, to make when you're selecting colors and finishes in your new space or your remodeled space. So the, my first tip is to avoid the patchwork quilt syndrome. When you think about your home, we're all, we have all had some sort of residential space experience, your own home, many times we pick one carpet for the kids' bedrooms, one carpet for our bedroom, different flooring for the living room, different flooring for the kitchen, different paint colors in each of those areas. And that might be fine in a residential space. But in a commercial space, we don't want to have that patchwork quilt syndrome. We want to have unifying elements and repetition because we need to manage that facility. If something does wear out, we need to be able to quickly and easily figure out what it is. We need to have um, a color scheme that unifies the space so it's pleasant and not overwhelming. We need to make sure that um, we are able to incorporate those patterns in such a way that, again, is not cluttered looking. So keeping in mind that even though you may have multiple areas within sub areas within perhaps your library, look at those as um, just small variations of color or pattern, not completely different spaces typically. You need something to um, unify them all. Another quick tip is public spaces versus employee or private spaces. If you have a little bit of extra money, I would recommend spending that, of course, in the public space. Um, put a solid surface, perhaps like a Corian type, to use a manufacturer name, countertop in, something that's a harder surface versus a laminate, like for mica, for example, um, in the back. Uh, employee break room area. Use, use that money up front where you really can get a lot of bang for your buck. I mentioned this a little bit before, um, architectural finishes, um, keeping some things neutral versus colors. Uh, one takeaway I would have for you is many of the commercial furniture, the commercial furniture you have will last a very, very long time if you choose um, from reputable manufacturers. That furniture, if you choose it in a color, a bright color, for example, like if you picture this desk in um, a, let's say a maroon, like my maroon example here, um, that furniture will actually ugly out before it wears out. You'll get tired of the color before it wears out. So anything that's a more permanent space, try to keep those as more neutral. So you see in this example, we have the ivory colored desk, the more neutral wood, the gray base. Um, the color is put into the walls. Walls um, can be easily repainted. Now, it still takes money, but it takes less money to repaint a wall than to completely replace an entire reception desk that's been built in. Also, when budgets are limited, we want to think about adding color in areas that can be easily uh, changed out. Excuse me. So if you take a look at these um, end caps to the bookcases here, you can see these panels that are available. Those are just small panels that can be changed out, um, and the more trendy color could be put in there rather than the entire end cap. Um, 
It could also be a wayfinding system, so a way to organize space by color, but keeping those areas small on anything that's more permanent and easily changed out will really keep your money, um, your budget extended to the point that you want it to be. Um, I'd also mention that looking at features like in furniture, like casters on your tables um, so that your wear patterns on your flooring are not such that you're dragging furniture across the, across the floor, you have casters. Um, and then integrating things like technology is really, of course, important as well. We know um, most people that come to commercial spaces now are expecting um, Wi-Fi and then their battery um, gets low and they need to plug in. So keeping in mind um, power outlets on um, furniture pieces is a really good way to make sure that your furniture will last into the future. Also, make sure you're coordinating with that architect, designer, or facility manager so that there is power actually at the location that you want to put it in the furniture. That's one thing um, that I see happen a lot is that furniture gets placed with a power port at the top. However, there's actually no way to connect it to power. So communicating early on that is really, really important. Um, a few details to bring it all together here. Um, we want to think about artwork, signage, lighting. Uh, you can see that this top left corner here, um, this is actually a, a public library in Waupon, Wisconsin, and um, they have kind of a complementary yellow, um, excuse me, orange-blue scheme going with the mural and the, the furniture on the floor there. Uh, but they brought in more colors with this artwork uh, that if they had left it just the plain brick walls, I think the space would not have been quite as exciting. You can also um, help make your spaces, your public spaces, seem more um, to a, a human scale. So a lot of times we get these vast spaces with high ceilings that feel kind of overwhelming. By bringing in um, lighting, for example, here on the left, bottom left, we have a, a light fixture that's actually a floor lamp. So that brings the scale of the, of the space down to a more relatable, almost residential feeling scale. Um, keeping those little accessories in there can really enhance the space and make it feel um, more comfortable. And of course, actually provide the functional task of more lighting when you have that space that might, be, might have poor lighting. Um, you can see up here, they added track lighting with these pendants, um, providing light over the, the um, countertop here, but it also adds an opportunity for another pop of color and texture. Another thing to think about is um, really those extra special details if your budget will allow. Um, one trend is to see this um, living wall, so an indoor garden. Um, indoor gardens or living walls have really been shown to improve air quality, increase productivity, and reduce stress and decrease noise. So it's a great solution for a library. This is the Harvard, Harvard Graduate School of Education's uh, library, and they added living walls to the space. Now, if you're going to add a living wall to a space such as this, I would recommend working with a company that specializes in this because you want to make sure um, that that foliage is watered properly and um, creates the atmosphere that you want. It's a very technical um, installation, but it is out there and available. Um, also things like um, mobiles or um, rotating art installations, I'm sure many of you have something like that where the community can come in and um, put their art up as a way to integrate this into the space. And so that's a, a great way to, um, for low cost um, spaces to get artwork pieces in. You, they can just be on loan from, from people in the community who are always looking for places to integrate their art. So those finishing touches really um, add some texture and some life um, to spaces. And it can be so easy for us sometimes to get so caught up in that, you know, the longevity and the durability factors and all of that that we forget about some of those things or we don't allot money in our budget for that. And I just want to make sure that um, if you have the opportunity to plan ahead, to try to plan a little bit into your budget and it just enhances the space so much. So a couple quick points to remember with this. Um, if you're stuck on where to begin with selecting color, start with those color harmonies. Go buy a color wheel. Um, it will create a pleasant coordinated look for you when you start with a color harmony. Uh, make sure that you vary the scale of patterns of furniture in your spaces, that large, medium, 
small variation. Look for the appropriate uh, double rubs resistance, around 100,000 is great for commercial spaces. And then all those performance finishes that I mentioned will enhance the cleanability factors. Um, definitely use neutral colors on items that will last for a long time. Um, you can see in this picture we have the neutral woods and then uh, black tabletops here. So that's being integrated with the bright colors on the wall. Don't forget to incorporate uh, power and technology and of course those finishing touches that put it all together. So um, hopefully that's generated some questions for you. Um, and if we can have a minute or two to answer one or so, uh, one or two, that would be great. And otherwise I'm sure we will follow up with some. So I'll turn it back over to Janet. Thank you, Jessica. This is really, really helpful information that I think all of us should be able to use. Um, I am, we do have quite a few questions, which we obviously won't be able to get to all of those. So like I said before, we will be following up with, with a detailed answer on those. Um, but the one question that I think maybe could apply to a lot of people would be, how do you go about changing this color scheme if you can't afford a complete renovation? That's a great question. Um, many, many times in spaces, what, um, what I will do is um, definitely start with the walls. The walls have so much impact um, that I will work on looking at changing the paint colors of the walls. And again, I will try not to fight with any existing architectural finishes in the space that need to be worked with. Um, trying to incorporate them rather than um, opposing them will work much better. And then um, in furniture, you can also sometimes do two things. Um, one, you can repaint, get electricity have companies that t do elect electrostatic painting, easy for me to say, um, and they can repaint uh, metallic furniture that you might have. Um, there's companies that do that to help refurbish it and reuse it. And also um, reupholstering some of your existing furniture. Um, you really can bring to the new life furniture that is already existing if you reupholster it. And just keep in mind some of these fabric um, finishing and selection tips that we've given you so that when you put that all together you're still creating a new piece that will last a long time but rather than purchasing it complete, completely new. Um, the other last thing I would say with that is to look at um, pieces that will provide you the most um, most impact so perhaps um, the first impression spaces that you just walk in and you see that space, maybe spend more uh, of the budgets there, even when it's limited, versus, again, some spaces that might be tucked away. Excellent advice. All those things should really be able to help stretch that budget. OK, we're going to wrap things up now. We'd like to thank Jessica for sharing her insights, insights and tips on how we can create more beautiful and timeless environments. Um, we hope that everyone was able to take away a few new ideas to try. Um, there was some great discussion, and we appreciate all of you sharing your time with us. You will be receiving a survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did. Please take a few moments to fill this out. We'd love your feedback so that you can make these sessions even better in the future. Feel free to comment on other topics that you'd like more information on or speakers you'd like to hear from so we can consider building some of those things into our future schedule. We've received some great feedback from our previous webinars, and that has really helped us to focus on the topics that you're most interested in. Tomorrow you'll receive a follow-up to this presentation that will include a link to this webcast. So if you missed something or just wanted to review, you can go back and refresh yourself on some of the topics or share with your colleagues. Next week you'll be receiving a second email that will include resources such as the slides, a Q&A log that documents and answers all the questions that came up today, and some additional reference materials that can give you more tools as you're preparing for um, your color updates and your fabrics and that type of thing. Again, thank you for joining us today. We'll be back on April 2nd with a webinar entitled Enhancing Early Literacy Story Times, Small Steps, Big Results. And that's being presented by Sue Nesbecka and McLeaf and Dr. Pam Schiller. Feel free to register for this program and watch the DEMCO website for other new programs in our 2014 offering. We'll continue sending emails announcing new webinars in the months to come. We hope that you'll consider joining us for some of these future events. And again, so glad you joined us and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.